is long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope in this world where'er we roam. Ancient words will guide us. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart, holy words. Number 432, 432, I can't help but uh, think about when we sing this song we should look at each other from, from Steve's class this morning about edifying each other and I think this is a good song for us to do that. If you would just join me in standing please, 432. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Wonderful words of life, sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life, all so freely given, wooing us to heaven, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful 
wonderful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Please be seated. To help turn our minds to the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 367. 367. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered crown Makes me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can stand on my own. Faithful like to follow along, I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear that those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have forgotten your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the, do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I find it interesting that when the Lord speaks to this church here in Ephesus, he doesn't rebuke them from some great evil that they have done. He doesn't rebuke them for lust or pride, anger, greed, fear, any of the many sins they, struggle, they might struggle with. He doesn't rebuke them for not having done many good works. In fact, he praises them for that. But instead, he rebukes them. This church that they have forgotten their first love. When we come to the table this morning, we come before it every week, one of our purposes should be to remind us of our first love. To remind us of what Christ has done for us. To remember His many blessings. To remember that He will come again. To remember the home He has prepared for us. Let us pray as we remember our Lord and Savior as we remember our God. Holy Father, Lord God, as we come before you this morning, we want to pause and remember the body of your beloved Son hung on a tree. To remember the faithful love that you showed to us. With the willing sacrifice. Lord, I pray your blessing upon us as we partake in that memory. I pray you help us to never forget that. To never abandon that love for you. Help us to always have it on our mind. Help it to always influence our thoughts, our actions. Please be with us now as we partake. We pray this, we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Holy Father, before we partake of the cup, representing the blood, the innocent blood of your Son, we just want to pause and give you thanks that you did not leave us in our sin, that you did not leave us hopeless, that you did not leave us to our condemnation that was justified and said freely offered lifeblood to wash us clean, to cleanse us and that we might be pure, that we might be holy, that we might become your children. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us as we partake of this cup in remembrance of the blood of our Savior. Lord, we ask all this, we pray this in the name of our Savior, Lord Jesus. Amen.
before we take for the offering, a prayer for the offering. Um, our church has many different forms we can offer, whether that's collection plate, multiple places, whether it's online. I just want to offer a quick verse from Job. Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. After, after Job loses all of his family and all of his property, Job's word, words to his wife, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, God, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy Father, as we come before you again this morning, we we just want to pause and give you thanks for the many, many blessings you give us in this life. And Lord, we also thank you even for the trials that you give us. That help strengthen and bind us to you. Lord, we know that this world and everything in it is not permanent. We know that our lives are not meant to last forever here. I just pray help us I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to use what you have given us, what you have blessed us with to your glory. To spread your word, to spread your name, to spread your praise. Pray that all that we might offer might be used wisely. Pray that you are with us each and every day, each and every moment. Lord, we ask all this, we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. If you are using your psalm books uh, or you're online, our song of invitation after Greg's lesson will be number 426. 426. The song before our scripture reading and prayer is number 542, if you will please join me in standing. And if you will remain standing afterwards for the scripture and for prayer. 542. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the folk in veils below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is a victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner. With shouts of triumph trod By faith they like a whirlwind spread Swept on o'er every fear The faith by which they conquered death Is still a shining shield Faith is a victory Faith is a victory Oh Wide rain which shall be given before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love of flame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' hungry name. Faith is a victory.
<laughs> Can you? That okay? Do I need to move? The big boy's been up here. For... <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, this is Mark 7, 1 through 13. Uh, and it's going to sound like it's a bust on the elders, but it's not. It is uh, really calling to, um, for us, not to get caught up in the traditions of men and to keep our hearts focused on the commands of God. Um, so, traditions and commandments. Mark 7, verses 1 through 13. I'm going to read from the ESV, English Standard Version, this morning. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with the defiled hands? And he said to them, well did, Isaiah, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. Please pray with me. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and reigning king of the universe. Please forgive us, Father, when we get wrapped up in our traditions. Traditions can blind us, and frequently our traditions can stand in the way of blessings you may be trying to bring to us. Help us to let go of our man-made traditions and to stay more focused on your word and commands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Signal Mountain. Oh, it was great to be together. Got a lot of our family here. Some of them are going to Searcy afterward to uh, visit Harding. And uh, it's just good to see all of you here today. I was going to have a stand and greet each other, but we'll forego that. Uh, yeah, we will. Okay. Uh, look at your... I want to thank Danny for the song selection today and also Stephen for the devotion at Communion. We are truly a blessed people. I love the way Steve started us off with that looking at the praises of God too as we begin our worship. We're people called together but we're also people called to God, right? That's our, he is our focus as we look at one another even. You're made in God's image and God's likeness and we're to help each other to become more like him as we meet, as we worship, as we fellowship with one another on a day-to-day -day basis. And as we look at this particular passage of scripture we're in Mark's gospel um, just had a class on this chapter with some of my grandkids a couple of them and uh, I see Brisa smiling we have been studying through Mark's gospel in a uh, high school level course that I'm teaching to uh, Brisa and Noah for their high school class any of you want to take an elective high school class let me know we can Make it available for you. And it's a look at Jesus and looking at how we can be, understand him and how we can be like him. Before we start this text, I want to turn to 1 John, though. In, in chapter 2, beginning verse 4, John writes, 
1 John chapter 2, verse 4. No one or the one who says, I have come to know him, I know him, and does not keep his commandments. Read that one more time. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is what? A liar. A liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God. Get this. Whoever keeps the word of Jesus, whoever keeps the word of God, in him the love of God has been truly, mine says perfected, it means matured, completed. By this we know we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. If I say I know Jesus, but I do what I want to do and don't follow what he tells me to do, what am I? I'm a liar. I'm a liar. I'm a hypocrite at best. But if I just seek to walk in the light as he is in the light, listen to his word, try to follow him, am I going to be perfect? No. I wish, huh? But I will be on the path. You'll be walking in the light. As you stumble along, his blood will continue to cleanse you from all sin. This is the path that we are called to. It's a path of holiness. It's a path of life. A path... Really, Jesus is the way, the truth, the light. He is the way that we walk. If we will listen and learn from him and follow him. We're looking at the Gospel of Mark, and they've asked the question... Who is this? And I think that's the question that I want to make the theme of this whole study. Who is this that we're looking at in Jesus Christ? Where did I put that paper? I wrote three sermons this week on this very passage. And now I've lost the paper that I wanted. Oh, there it is. Okay. I wanted to share with you. I, yesterday, with Jenny's dad, I was... Um, asking him would he listen to me and he said sure so I sat down I went over the lesson and about halfway through the first page I was looking at him his eyes were glazing over <laughs> and I thought how, how, how am I doing <laughs> so back to the drawing board um, so here's what I'm going to give you today <clears throat> When Jesus faced the poor and needy people of his day, even the tax collectors and sinners, he showed amazing grace and compassion, forgiveness of sins, healing the sick, casting out demons, delivering God's word and calling everyone to repentance and faith. He fed 5,000 plus women and children 5,000 men plus women and children with five loaves, five tortillas, and two fish. Demonstrating love and mercy and kindness and care through the power of God. It was unmatched anywhere before or since. Jesus reached out to those who were reaching out to him in this way. But, and this is a real important one, on the other hand... When Jesus faced the religious leaders who rejected him, if they threw roadblocks at his ministry, if they hindered those who wanted to come to him with threats that you'll be kicked out of the synagogue if you do, and by the way, that was happening. If you support Jesus, you get kicked out of the synagogue. To those people, Jesus, listen, he unleashed the wrath of God. He pronounced the strongest condemnations you'll read anywhere in the Bible in Matthew 23 to those who are blocking his ministry of seeking the lost and saving those who strayed. Now we're studying his life. And if you've noticed, if you've been paying attention, 
ask yourself, how did Jesus treat these Pharisees and these uh, scribes who came to him early on and were questioning him? They always threw questions at him. How did he treat them? I find it interesting. Up until chapter 7, Jesus is very gracious. He is... He speaks, he goes back to scripture. He always founds everything he says in the scriptures. And then he maybe tells a parable. But it's very reasonable how you take his parables and apply the scriptures to it and say, that is what Jesus is telling us to do. And he says that graciously, mercifully in that sense, and gently. Even to those who were opposing him. But they didn't like the answers he gave, and their resistance just got worse. I mean, what we've seen thus far in the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is becoming an extremely popular preacher. Herod even heard about him. Herod thinks he's John the Baptist raised from the dead. He's not just a preacher. In fact, the thing he's known for, most likely, is his power. I mean, power. We've talked about that, haven't we? Casting out demons, first, thing, first miracle in Mark. Healing the sick. Continuing to do that. And, and then forgiving sins. And saying... To show you I have authority, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Paralytic, get up, take up your mat and go in front of everybody. And they all praise God. They haven't seen anything like this before. And then as his disciples are eating some grain on the wrong day of the week, in their minds, some of the, these religious leaders say, How, why are your disciples doing that? They're breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus said, basically... He ends by saying the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. They didn't like that answer. And they begin to design ways to get rid of him. While others can't wait to get with him. Strange, isn't it? Very ironic. There there were crowds of people. By the time we get to chapter 6, there's so many people coming after Jesus. It says... Verse 56 of chapter 6. Whenever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying sick in the marketplace, entreating him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched it were cured. He can't go anywhere without people just just coming to him. He goes across the lake, and they run around and meet him over there. He can't get away from the crowds. It's amazing the popularity of Jesus has grown so high, so strong, so amazing. He sends out the 12 and they go preach repentance in the kingdom of God. And so he's ministering by teaching, but he's known for his miracles. And then comes chapter 7. Jesus has been gentle with even his opponents up until now. And in chapter 7, let's go through this. It says, And Pharisees and some scribes gathered around him, mine says, when they'd come from Jerusalem. They came from Jerusalem. Do you know how far Jerusalem is from Galilee? It's a long walk. You're talking about a three or four day journey. Depends on which way they went. Probably went around Samaria. It would take them a long time to get there. That makes him real important, that you've got to send some guys from down in Jerusalem. Let's go get the big boys to come in here and help us with this guy. So that's what the religious leaders are thinking. So they came from Jerusalem, and what did they notice? Verse 2, they had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure, that is, unwashed hands. Aha! We got you. You got guys in your group that don't even wash their hands before they eat bread. Yeah. You know, this is a very insignificant point because they really are mad, not because they weren't just washing their hands right. They were breaking something. What were they breaking? 
the tradition of the elders. And we got to talk about that a little bit. He says, verse 3 and 4, there's an explanation that Mark gives us in verses 3 and 4, chapter 7. The Pharisees and all the Jews not, do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands. It's fist wash their hands. So wash their hands carefully or with their fists, like this. Thus observing the traditions of the elders. This was not just to have clean hands before you eat your meal. This was a ceremonial cleansing so their hands were holy. Paul will even talk about the prayers of the people are lifting what kind of hands? Holy hands unto God. It's not hands that are washed. It's hands that are doing the work of God, the will of God. Holy hands are those who do what God wants you to do. They're not those who've been defiled by touching somebody in the marketplace who may have touched a, a lizard or something. But that's the way the Jews thought. And so... They carefully washed their hands, observing the tradition of the elders. What is this tradition of the elders? Do you know what that is? A little bit later than this time frame, there will be a book collected called the Mishnah. The Mishnah had within it an entire chapter devoted to how you wash your hands in order to be undefiled when you eat. And the Jewish Talmud had said that the Mishnah and the words of the Mishnah are to be obeyed even above the Scriptures. The Talmud stated that. And that was a foolish statement by some rabbi, but it was in there. That's traditions that came to them. Verse 4, he's, Mark is going on to explain. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. This word cleanse is the word baptize. Now, that probably doesn't mean they baptize their whole body. It's probably baptize their hands. They thoroughly wash their hands. And there are many other things that they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups. That's the word baptizing again. Of cups, of pitchers, of copper pots. You even have the word couches. It wasn't a couch like, <laughs> can you imagine taking your couch and dipping it in water? It was a rolled out mat that they would get on to eat. Or if they were sick, they laid on it. It was a kind of a pad that you, it was called a sick bed in some cases. But it was a, a pad. And they would wash these to keep themselves from being defiled. Is there anything wrong with washing your hands or washing pitchers or cups or glasses? We do it. Our house, I, I think you probably all do. Maybe I don't do it as well as I should. How many of you ever washed dishes maybe at a time when you didn't know what you were doing and your parents came along and told you, we got to clean that one better. Anybody have that happen to you? Ah, i got a few hands. Yeah. You learn to do it right, right? That's the tradition of parents, taught to children. That's not a bad thing. But when you make it a matter of spiritual significance, it can become a bad thing. Verse 5, And the Pharisees and scribes ask him. So the Pharisees have come to Jesus and I believe they were looking to find fault with him. And so they ask him, because of what is the Greek here? Why, we would say, because of what or why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hand, that impure hands, defiled hands? I want to find my line on that one. Oh, well, I won't look for it too much. They came looking for what was wrong with Jesus. And Jesus uh, returned the favor. You want to find something wrong? It's almost like Jesus said, I'll show you something wrong. His words, verse 6, pretty stinging. He said to them, Isaiah was right, or rightly, did Isaiah prophesy about you, what? What do you got there? Hypocrites, you fakes. You act one way, you are a different way. You fakes. You hypocrites, as it's written. You actors. Here's what Isaiah said about you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of who? Of men, of people, human beings, human commandments. Verse 8, neglecting the command of God, the word of God, the laws of God, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. And he was also saying, let's just get it clear, he's really hammering this home. You nicely, that word nicely, you have a great way. It's really a little sarcasm here. You have a great way of setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Moses said, here's the word of God from Moses, who you respect. Honor your father and your mother and... He who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. Whoa. Honor your father and mother and don't talk bad of them. That'd be pretty strong words, right? But you say, in other words, the word of God says this, but here's your word. You say, if a man says to his father or his mother, anything of mine that might have been helped, that you might have been helped by is, is a gift devoted to God. It's Corban. It's a gift devoted to God. Look at verse 12. He says, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Who stops them from doing good to their father and mother if they say korban? The religious authorities stop them. It's like the high court says, you can't help your parents now. And they would rule in favor of the kid who said korban about all of his stuff. Now you can't help your father or mother. But you can use it for yourself. Verse 13, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Wow. This passage teaches us a whole lot about Jesus. It teaches us a whole lot about ourselves, I think. Which is more important the word of God or the word of men? Right? The word of God. I think we can, we, can we all agree that that's true? Which do we listen most to and follow? The word of God or the word of men? Thank you. That's the right answer. <laughs> You know what? I look at my own life and I have to ask myself, how much of my life is really traditions of men and how much of it is really shaped by and formed completely by the words of God? How much of our church family? Our goal, isn't it, is to restore New Testament Christianity, to do it the way Jesus called us to do it. Is that not true? It better be. That's what Jesus is calling everybody to. It's not just... This is the most important. It's not just at church, though. Okay? I think the tradition of man has become what you do in church is really vitally important. Be careful at church. Don't step out of line at church. But when you walk out those doors, you can go and do just about anything you want to do, and that's okay because it's not the holy ground place. How am I doing? I grew up that way in a lot of ways, thinking those kinds of things. Your church is very, 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 and I do believe the closer you get to God, the more you better behave yourself. I really think there's something to that in the scriptures. And we gather as God's people, we have a, we have a different source of strength from God than we have when we're just dispersed. I, that's why... Bible talks about when you're gathered together and the power of the Spirit is present, then you do certain things that you can't do otherwise. Okay, there's something special about this meeting. But I want to say this, the Word of God when you walk out of here is still the Word of God that needs to be practiced everywhere. Isn't that true? And so when I come into this place, I want to be a person who walks into this place having walked with God before I got here, and here I walk with God, and after I leave here, I continue to work with, walk with God. Right? That is it. 
That's what Jesus, I think, is after here in part. You, you've made traditions, he says, they're, and you teach them as if they're God's word when they're not. I want to talk about culture a minute. Oh, we didn't change the title, did we? No, it says that there are two. The title is supposed to be The Culture and Traditions of Christ. The Culture and Traditions of Christ. I changed it, but it didn't get on the, on the board in time. I believe that Jesus came here to create a culture. He didn't come here to follow the culture. He came here to lead it. Lead it to himself. He didn't come here to follow the traditions of men. He came here to give us the traditions of God and to follow him. We often excuse our behaviors because that's the way the culture is. And I believe we use a verse wrongly. I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That verse is abused. Paul would never, ever leave the words of God in order to do something that fit men's ways. He wouldn't do it. Now, would he reach out to people who are lost and in trouble? Yes. Did Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? Yes. Jesus loved sinners. But I'll tell you this, he did not love sin. Jesus was a friend of sinners, but he was no friend of sin. Period. Ever. Can't be. He came to sinners to save them from their sins. He knows who's drowning, and he reaches out to the drowning to bring them into safety. That's his, that's his work. That's, his, that's what he died for. I... I love Jesus. <laughs> Don't you? And I want to be like him. And I know that's a lifelong quest. It's not just a quest to do at church. It's a quest to do every day. Cultures shift and change real easily. And they reflect and they react to developments, discoveries, popular opinions, periods of time. You think of music and fashion and value shifts and moral codes. Culture shifts, doesn't it? We see it all around us. Has American culture changed in the last 20 years? <laughs> yeah, changed a lot, hasn't it? We've defined marriage differently in the last 20 years, since 2015, I think it was. I say we. Well, you know what I mean. And now we're seeing culture shift more and more in a direction away from God's ways. And here's the, here's the problem. Here's the world and here's the church, okay? When the, ch when the world moves into darkness, the danger of the churches will fill the tension and will go behind it. We'll keep a distance. Oh, we'll keep a distance. But we're still, we end up being where the world was back here. There are political parties who have shifted way, way over to places that they never would have been at just a few years ago. And there are political parties saying and doing things that they never would have said or done just a few years ago. There's a lot of, of official politeness that used to just go on. And both of them are messing up that we have in the U.S., I believe. Okay, that's my judgment. Cultures can shift and change so fast. But traditions, traditions are defined as the transmission of the cultural practices from one generation to the next. Okay, A tradition is like an anchor that locks you in to a behavior and a value system that won't shift and change. If you go up here, not too far in Van Buren County, you can go to the Amish community and they ride in horses and they or bicycles and they try to avoid a lot of the modern things they're they're there's trying to be tradition stuck is what that is it is there's something kind of beautiful about it and something kind of weird about it but 
Traditions are powerful because they stick you into places and you won't change from them. Culture is powerful and it will move you out of those stuck places into wherever it wants to go. Okay? In the culture of our time, it's clashing with the traditions of our time. That's what we're seeing happen in our world today. And I would say all those traditions of America that are based on human thinking and human planning that are not in accordance with the Word of God are dangerous because they hold you to something that isn't of God. But all the culture that changes and moves away from the Word of God and the will of God and the teachings of God are dangerous because they'll pull you that way. How am I doing? Would you agree? We are a people of the Word of God. Okay? We're a people who've been called by God through His Word, and He didn't just give it in a record on paper with ink or whatever they used. He gave it in a human being, His Son, so we could see the Word. We could know the Word's way. And He is the way. We could see Him in life, and we could follow that life. So in our passage here, the, these traditionalists who are locked in the, 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 the traditions of the elders, which are not gri- biblical based on Scripture, find a flaw with Jesus. And Jesus returns their favor by giving them a clear, glaring, gaping flaw that their tradition has done. Their tradition has broken the fifth commandment. Okay? The first four are about God. No other gods. No images. Watch the, how you use the name of God. Keep the Sabbath holy. That's God's day of rest. Then the fifth one is honor your father and your mother. And that one becomes a huge one. And what have they done with their traditions? They've broken the fifth commandment. It's the first commandment with a promise. It's the first commandment that shifts from the way you treat God to the way you treat each other. It's the highest one in that regard. And their tradition broke it. And so Jesus knows their hearts. And he shows them how far they are from God. Instead of obeying defending God, they're breaking what God said. And they've set up a system that will enforce it with law. Human traditions are likely the culture will shift the traditions. And when the human traditions shift and they become popular, they can be encoded into law. And then everybody better keep them. Is that happening today? Is it? You say, Greg, you're talking politics. No, I'm talking the word of God right out of this text. I'm saying what Jesus said. Don't accuse me of being political here. If you're going to accuse me of something, accuse me of talking about traditions of men versus the Word of God. You can accuse me of that and be accurate. If it applies to family, it applies to family. If it applies to church, it applies to church. If it applies to politics, it applies to politics, okay? I'll agree with that. But don't accuse me of being political. They set up a system that they encoded in law and enforced it on others. And they came to find fault with Jesus. If we say, Lord, Lord, to Jesus, but make up our own traditions and disobey Jesus' teachings, what might Jesus say when he comes to us? What might he say? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Or will he say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness, you who break my laws. 
If we allow worldly culture to shape what we practice as a church and we build traditions that are in violation of God's word and especially if we defend them and pass them on to our children, what are we doing differently from these Pharisees in Jerusalem? Nothing. To be clear, let me be clear. Becoming all things to all men cannot include doing things contrary to God's word. Those who twist Paul's words to mean that should take notice of what Jesus says in this chapter and repent. On the other hand, on the other hand, Jesus gives us a standard by which we can measure cultures and traditions in this world. The word of God gives us a standard by which we can see that which is light and that which is darkness. And the word of God is our tool by which we can walk on the path of life and know with a certainty God is calling you home. And he's calling you to himself. And he has a great reward for those who will go through this world being shot at from both sides and stand firm in the way of Jesus. And that's the road this church must take. Will we do it? Will you do it? Will I do it? There is a price to pay. There's a price to pay. It's probably the least popular thing you can do in this world today. But it's the most important. And somebody's got to do it. And you, brothers and sisters, I, we are the body of Christ. We are. God's calling you. Through his son, come to me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. Take my yoke on you. Learn of me. Learn of me. Learn of me. With a yoke with Jesus, we can go wherever he wants us to go. Do whatever he wants us to do. Just yoke up with the Lord and follow his way. If you have any need at all, we offer an invitation right now. If you need, please come while we stand and sing to encourage you. You may be seated.
got several announcements this morning, but I'll try to go through those quickly because I know everybody wants to go to lunch. So, what a great day. And if you like cold weather, it's even better because it is chilly out there. Okay, first thing, in two weeks, um, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, the 22nd, instead of meeting on Wednesday for our Thanksgiving service, we're going to do that on Tuesday at 6.30. So put that on your calendars, because if you show up on Wednesday, there probably won't be anybody here. So Tuesday we'll have our Thanksgiving service. A number of ladies who are trying to prepare for Thanksgiving dinners for their family, um, it's tough for them to get everything done and be here on Wednesday. So we're going to do that on Tuesday. Uh, secondly, there is a questionnaire in the uh, foyer. Uh, there's been some interest expressed by some of our members of the congregation to explore hiring a full-time youth minister. Uh, the elders are reaching out to, find, to families to get a sense of desirability and the level of support for that. So those, we would like you to take a look at those, answer a few questions, and turn those back in. They're, uh, they're, on, the they're on the table, okay. Not in the foyer, they're on the table. And so that, no, this is for, this is for everyone. Everyone, yes, yes. So uh, please take a look at those, fill those out, and return those to us. And before any rumors get started, Kendall is not going anywhere. Um, he is going to be with us, God willing, for a long, long time. So just remember that. But we're just exploring this idea. Okay. Um, Grant, I've got to apologize to you last week. You weren't here, um, but... I was going to congratulate you guys on being runners-up in the state band. Uh, and the reason I'm apologizing, I looked over there, and you weren't there, and I saw Jack. And that's all I could think of was Jack. So, so congratulations. Good job. Well done. And we have another person I'd like to, and he's not here, Caden uh, Napier. Uh, he is on the Sigma Mountain cross-country team. And they won the state championship this year. And Caden was a very big part of that. Um, his coach came to him uh, before the meet and said, if we have any chance of winning the state championship, you're going to have to cut about 40 seconds off your time. And for you guys who run a little bit, 40 seconds is a lot. And guess what? Caden cut 40 seconds off his time. And because of that, they became state champions. So, Caden, you're not here, but congratulations if you're listening online. Uh, we have a number of people who are uh, suffering as far as health is concerned. We want to remember the Marcotts, uh, Angie Maynard, uh, Hector, and glad to hear from Rachel that he's doing well, um, Heath, uh, uh, Ernie Cooper, who had uh, cataract surgery. Um, let's remember all those folks in our prayers, and I know you have been, so let's, let's keep remembering them and praying for them. Also, uh, Carol Lockhart lost her brother this week, and please remember Carol in your prayers as well. Um, Joanne Lucas is moving to Florida. Her address is in the uh, uh, bulletin, so take a look at that and, and stay in contact with her and write her a letter. Okay. Uh, birthdays. Got a bunch of them. Bill Hill, Lee Whitfield, Asher and Benjamin Stewart, Brent Clark, Brenda Schwartz, David Bible, Will Green, Becky Pace, Susan Gray, and Sheila Gregory. So happy birthday to all those. Uh, and I hope you, uh, your folks take care of you this week. Okay, are there any other announcements? Am I forgetting anything? Martin Boyd. Oh, Martin Boyd, yes, and that's the youth group. Is that right, Kendall? Yes, sir. Be handling the service at Martin Boyd. Be here at 2.15. Okay, all right, everybody got that. All right, before we dismiss, let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for a great day. We see your hand and, and how it's working in this congregation. And I pray that your blessings will continue to be poured down upon us and that we will, as a, as a congregation, as, as your body, that we will continue to work for you that we can spread the good news of Christ. I thank you for this day. I thank you for our time of worship and fellowship. 
be with all those who have been mentioned this morning with their health issues and, and deaths. And I pray that you will give all peace, comfort, and, and health to come. Thank you for all those who uh, work in this congregation, for all those who work behind the scenes that are, that are never noticed, but I know that you know what they're doing, and, and we're thankful for that. I pray that you will go with us today to our small groups. And I pray that all of us will uh, continue to love one another and to love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.